In the following module, we are going to discuss the procedure for abdominal paracentesis. By the end of this module, the user should be able to identify the indications, contraindications, complications and precautions for abdominal paracentesis. Enlist the essential steps involved in the procedures of diagnostic and therapeutic paracentesis and perform a simulation of diagnostic and therapeutic paracentesis on an adult patient with clinically evident ascites with minimal complications. Ascites describes a condition of pathological fluid accumulation within the peritoneal cavity. A variety of medical conditions may manifest with the clinical presentation of ascites which is encountered most frequently in the setting of cirrhotic liver disease. Abdominal paracentesis entails the diagnostic or therapeutic drainage of this fluid. The indications for diagnostic paracentesis includes all patients with new onset ascites. Diagnostic paracentesis should be repeated in patients when features suggestive of ascitic fluid infection develop. Additionally, surveillance paracentesis to rule out ascitic fluid infection should be performed in all patients with ascites who are newly admitted at the time of hospital admission. Therapeutic or large volume paracentesis lacks absolute indications, but it should be considered in patients with ascites refractory to medical therapy and in patients with rapidly refilling ascites. The absolute contraindications for the procedure are limited and include coagulopathy. Clinically evident disseminated intravascular coagulopathy is an absolute contraindication to paracentesis. However, isolated thrombocytopenia or coagulopathy in the absence of clinically evident bleeding manifestations is not a contraindication to the procedure. Additionally, pre-procedure blood transfusion is not indicated prior to paracentesis. Hemodynamic instability is an absolute contraindication to large volume paracentesis. Areas of the abdominal wall with local infection in God's subcutaneous veins, surgical scars or abdominal wall hematomas should be avoided while performing diagnostic or therapeutic paracentesis. Additionally, while the procedure may safely be performed in the following situations, by experienced personnel, extreme caution is advisable in pregnancy, massive organomegaly, bowel obstruction and abdominal wall adhesions. Paracentesis is a sterile procedure. Sterile gloves, drapes and dressing sets are mandatory. Sterile gowns, masks and goggles are additionally optional. Skin disinfection should be carried out with 0.5 to 2% chlorhexidine or betadine and spirit. Skin, subcutaneous tissue and abdominal wall layers up to the parietal peritoneum should be anesthetized with 1 to 2% lidocaine with or without adrenaline. A 1.5 to 3.5 cm 20 to 22 gauge needle with a 5 to 20 ml syringe attached is usually employed for the diagnostic procedure. Larger bore 16 to 18 gauge needles should be used for therapeutic paracentesis and connected to a sterile container with non-collapsible tubing. Sterile vials should be prepared for sample collection. Ascitic fluid cultures should preferably be inoculated into blood culture bottles at the bedside. The sterile field should be prepared and equipment arranged accordingly with strict asepsis prior to initiating the procedure. Three conventional approaches for abdominal paracentesis have been described. The midline subumbilical approach with the site of needle entry 2 cm below the umbilicus in the midline of the abdomen and the right and left lower quadrant approaches with the site of needle entry 3 finger breadths above and medial to the anterior superior iliac spine. The selection of site is guided by the following important factors. The abdominal wall being thicker in the midline accompanied by the possibility of bladder injury has made a midline approach less favorable in recent times. Should a midline approach be considered, the patient should be instructed to empty the bladder pre-procedurally. Areas of surgical scars such as a midline scar in this patient should be avoided as bowel may be adherent to the peritoneal surface of the abdomen at these locations. This most frequently is an impediment to the right lower quadrant approach secondary to an appendectomy scar. 
In cirrhotic patients and lactulose, excessive gas produced during its bacterial metabolism may result in a dilated cecum. A right lower quadrant approach is hence preferably avoided in such patients. In either of the lower quadrant approaches, the site of needle entry should be ensured to be lateral to the border of the rectus abdominis muddle to prevent injury to the inferior epigastric artery. Verbal and written informed consent is taken from the patient. The patient is then positioned, site for paracentesis is selected and the area cleaned and draped to prepare the sterile field. The skin is anesthetized with 1 to 2 percent lidocaine using a 22 or 25 gauge needle. The needle is gradually advanced into deeper layers of the subcutaneous tissue, aspirating every 2 to 3 millimeters prior to injecting. Once a loss of resistance is felt and peritoneal fluid is drawn into the syringe, the peritoneal cavity has been entered as seen here. Additional anesthetizing agent is then injected to anesthetize the pain-sensitive parietal peritoneum. The needle and syringe are then withdrawn. Approximately 4-5 to 5 ml of lidocaine is generally adequate for local anesthesia. To prevent leakage of fluid from the site of needle entry during paracentesis, the skin puncture site should not directly overlie the puncture site into the peritoneal cavity. This may be accomplished in two ways. The Z-Track technique accomplished by drawing the skin 2 cm downward with the non-dominant hand where the needle and syringe are advanced into the peritoneal cavity, as demonstrated here. Once the skin is released and the needle removed, the skin assumes its original position, effectively sealing the path of needle entry. And the angular insertion technique, in which the needle is inserted at an acute angle to the skin surface and gradually advanced. This ensures that the skin opening is obliquely oriented to the peritoneal opening. The skin is pierced with the needle and the needle advances slowly through the underlying subcutaneous tissue in 5 mm increments while intermittently aspirating on the attached syringe. If therapeutic paracentesis is additionally required, the needle is stabilized and the syringe carefully disconnected. Non-collapsible tubing is then attached to the needle in situ and connected to a sterile collection bottle or bag. Patients undergoing large volume paracentesis should be monitored intraprocedurally for hypotension and tachycardia. Intravenous albumin is not indicated in LPP less than 4 to 5 liters. For volumes more than 5 liters, 6 to 8 gram per liter of 25% albumin infusion has been proven efficacious in preventing hepatorenal syndrome. Complications encountered during paracentesis include technical complications seen in about 5-7% to of procedures, which includes failure to collect peritoneal fluid, leakage of ascitic fluid from the puncture site, and intermittent collection during an LVP. These necessitate repositioning or repeat puncture. Major complications are significantly rarer. These include hemorrhagic complications such as abdominal wall hematomas or spontaneous hemoperitoneums, infectious complications such as secondary bacterial peritonitis, hollow viscous perforation, and post-paracentesis hypotension, which may be encountered with large volume paracentesis, particularly when albumin is not appropriately replenished. Thank you for watching this video. See the associated text for more information.